Well, hey, hey, what's up, Revs? Good to be with you guys tonight. I am glad to be with you. I am even more glad that all of you made a decision to show up to church tonight because we are continuing in our series called Unboxing the Bible. And in this series, we are we're diving into some different topics and different themes, and we are unboxing the Bible to see what it has to say about them. Now, Sometimes the problem with some of the questions or the topics or the themes we bring to the Bible is how familiar we are to them. Because sometimes our familiarity can actually blind us to the purpose of a thing or the, or the design of a thing. For instance, uh, my wife and I, my family and I, we love Chinese food. You guys you feel me on that? Love Chinese food, okay? But we specifically love Chinese takeout. Like, I'm not sure if it's overstating it, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's scientifically accurate to say that when you're eating Chinese food in your own house, in your comfy slippies, like, it is the only correct way to eat Chinese food. You know what I'm saying? Like, we, we love it in my house, so we get it all the time. And it's a magical thing. It's a magical experience. And I didn't think it could become more magical, but it can. Because did you know that the little paper box that your Chinese food comes in is actually designed to unwrap and become a plate for your food? Yeah, because it is, friends, it is. So now, not only are you eating Chinese food in your slippies, you're also not dirtying a dish, praise God, all right? That is a dish you do not have to clean up, friend. But look, there's another one of these that I just found out recently, it just blew my mind. So any day of the week, I will always choose to drink pop from the fountain at McDonald's, any day of the week. It is infinitely better than like a canned pop, always, okay? But did you know that those fountain drinks, or the cups that those fountain drinks come in, the drinks, you put the drink in the fountain, the cup with the fountain drink, you know what I'm saying. That is actually designed, the lid of that is actually designed to come off and become a coaster for your cup that fits perfectly And then there's a little rim around it, and that rim is designed to catch all of the condensation that comes off of your cup so it doesn't ruin your countertop. I mean, aren't you glad you came to church tonight? Like, I am blowing your mind with life-transforming information right now, all right? Maybe not. But for real, the reason I'm telling you these things is because sometimes we, we can become so familiar with something, we think that we understand it completely, But we overlook what it's actually designed for. We overlook what it's made for or what power it has behind it. And I think sometimes we do that with our topic tonight because tonight we are talking about sex. Now listen, before we get carried away, let me make a couple of disclaimers, okay? Number one, tonight is not going to be gross, okay? There's going to be no pictures or charts, and it will only be minimally awkward, I promise you, all right? Number two, if you're new or this is your first time with us, hi. Super glad that you're here. So glad that you're with us. And I promise this is not the only thing that we ever talk about, so make sure you come back next week, okay? It's going to be great. Uh, But number three, and most importantly, tonight is not about shame. See, for a long time, the last place anyone ever wanted to go to talk about sex was the church, because they felt like they would be singled out, they would be made fun of, they'd be put to shame. And I'm telling you, that is not what we are about tonight. In fact, my goal for us tonight is for us to see and understand, maybe for the first time, that when the Bible talks about sex, it's talking about in a completely different way than what shame can offer us or what pop culture talks to us about. I hope that we deepen our understanding of what it means and how it impacts our lives. And so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about two ways that that sex impacts our lives and and see what the Bible has to say about that. And the first way that we're going to talk about this, the first way that we're going to kind of interact with this is, is to talk about how the Bible shows us our own disordered desires when it comes to sex. So listen, our desires are inward motivations, okay? It it, it was your desire to see your friends at school today or or to pass a test or or to to go to school uh, or to um, uh, play a sport that actually got you out of bed and and into school today. Like that or your parents waking you up and getting you to school. You know what I'm saying? Like it's our desires that help us endure through difficult situations. It's our desires that, that help us make the right decision even when it's difficult. 
It's also our desires that persuade us to do really stupid things sometimes too, okay? So, so what I'm saying is that all of the desires that we have going on inside of us are not bad. They're, they're a normal part of what it means to be a human being. But the problem comes when our desire comes first and we become enslaved to that desire and then have to do whatever it demands, whether we want to or not. To kind of put this into perspective, there was this one time Jesus was having a conversation with his disciples. Now, his disciples were his inner circle. They were his people. These are the guys that Jesus was investing in, and he was trying to teach them what, the world, what, what God's plan for the world was supposed to look like. And, and in this conversation, he was trying to show them what's at stake when some of our desires, no matter what they may be, are out of order. And, and he does this by, by asking them, and I think asking us too, a simple question. And the question is this right here. Jesus said, what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but are yourself lost and destroyed? So what is Jesus talking about here? Jesus is getting at the truth that our desires are eternal, which means that they have no end. They just keep going and going and going. So in other words, if we were to try to satisfy all of our desires, then we would have to have and experience everything. We would have to play every video game. We'd have to watch every Netflix special. We would have to visit every YouTube channel. We have to go to every country. We would have to eat at every restaurant. We have to go to uh, every party. We would have to have sex with everybody, even the old people, okay? Yeah, nobody wants that, all right? <laughs> nobody. And Jesus, Jesus is saying that even if we were able to do that, even if we were able to gain the whole world, we would lose ourselves to our desires and those desires would destroy us in the process because when our desires are disordered, when they are out of order, we experience destruction. And friends, this is just a, this is just a fact of life. In fact, let me give you an example. Um, after high school, I was in a band and we did some touring. We weren't famous or anything like that. We just, we just had a lot of shows on the road. And so whenever we got home, uh, all I ever wanted to do was be alone, uh, eat food, and watch movies. In fact, I still only want to do those three things, but I'm an adult now, and I have to pretend like I don't like those or whatever, but I totally do. Um, and there was this one time where there was a long stretch of time where it was like two months where we were off of the road. And you have to understand, like, I didn't have another job at this point in my life. All of my friends were in college, and I really didn't have anything to do. But there was a restaurant right down the road from me called Donato's Pizza, and they were open 24-7, and they had the best thin crust pizza I had ever had in my life, and so they were my people in this season of my life, all right? So what I did in my abundance of free time is I ordered pizza. And at first it started off really innocent, okay? I go to Donato's, I get a small pizza for myself, I eat it, it's delicious, you know? But at the end of it, I'm like, like I'm still hungry, like I could for sure still eat some more. So the next day I go back. And I get a medium pizza this time. And I eat the whole thing. And I'm thinking, I'm full. Like, I for sure don't need any more. I, I mean, I don't need any more. But, like, I mean, if you're going to offer me some more pizza, I'm going to take it. You know, I'm going to eat some more pizza, right? So I go back the next day. And the next day, I, I order a large pizza. And this time, I take it home with me because I'm a little embarrassed. But I, I eat the large pizza. I eat the whole thing, okay? Um, and I'm pretty sure if you look up the definition of a sad, lonely person, you just see a picture of me in my comfy slippies on my bed eating an entire large pizza by myself, okay? But I was hooked. I, I did this, I repeated this for weeks. I ordered pizza whenever I wanted to, sometimes twice a day. I started missing meals so that I would stay up super late in order for my stomach to have enough room in it to stuff an entire large pizza inside of it, okay? And some of you are like, there's no problem there, Brandon. Like, why are you complaining? Like, that sounds like the best life ever. What's wrong with you? But the problem came when it was time for me to go back on tour and none of my jeans fit because I had gained 15 pounds in three weeks. It was not a good look for me. Like, literally not a good look for me. And I didn't have any more money. So like my whole like rock star vibe, which was already not great in the first place, was completely ruined because my, my desires got ahead of my good decision making. Do you see what I'm saying? My, my, my point here is this. When we allow our desires to drive our life, we end up trying to fulfill all of our desires even when we don't want to and they destroy us or they destroy parts of our lives in the process. And so when it comes to sex, 
if we have no stops on that desire in our life, then it will be so easy for us to be led into destroyed relationships, destroyed self-image, and a destroyed perspective of everybody around us. Because the truth about our desire for sex is that it goes way beyond the physical. If we're honest with ourselves, I think many of us would, would say that we desire sex in order to feel like somebody else loves us, to feel like we're connected to somebody, to feel like we're not lonely, to feel like we're safe with another person. Others of us, if we were really honest, we would say that we desire sex so that we could build up our reputation, so that people wouldn't look at us and think that we're lame. Or, or, or we just feel like, man, I'm, I'm surrounded by peer pressure to do it and I have no other choice but to. And it turns out that we, we begin to view sex as this gateway to tap into our deepest desires. But I'm telling you, when we use sex like this, it will end up using us instead. Because friends, that's not, how sex, it, that's not what sex is designed for. A desire for sex is not a bad thing. Hear me on that. It's not a bad thing. But when we try to use sex to control our desires, they will end up controlling us. So the first thing that the Bible kind of teaches us about, our, 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 about how sex impacts our life is by showing us our own disordered desires. And the second thing that it does for us is it shows us the value of controlled desires. So in that conversation between Jesus and his disciples a little earlier, a few verses earlier, we see Jesus showing us what it means to move from disordered desires to controlled desires. So let's check out what he said in Luke chapter 6. Jesus said this, or Luke chapter 9, Jesus said this, If any of you wants to be my followers, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. Jesus is saying that if, if we want a life where we're not controlled by our desires, but that our desires are in control, then we will have to give control of our life over to Jesus. And the reason for this is because one of the most dominant driving desires of our life is our need for control. And, and we live at a time and in a culture that, that is constantly teaching us to use sex to gain control. We, we, we've convinced ourselves that we should be able to do whatever we want to whenever we want to. We should be able to have sex with anybody we want to. We should be able to watch porn whenever we want to. We should be able to use sex as a strategy for our social lives. And once we have that kind of control, then, then we'll be happy. But the problem with that desire for control in our life is that it is an illusion. It makes promises that it can never keep because when we try to go after all of those desires all of the time, whenever we want to, we don't end up gaining control of sex in our lives. We end up losing control of sex in our lives. And some of you know what that feels like. Because if I'm honest, what it feels like is when a boyfriend or a girlfriend tells you that they love you and that's all that you need to hear to compromise who you are or your faith, or your values. For others of us, it's that desire for control that leads us to try to figure out how to control the chaos in our life, or, or, or the, that, that feeling of loneliness that we have, and it pushes us, and it isolates us to watch porn. But what it leaves us with is secrets, shame, and a skewed perspective of ourselves and everyone around us. And then there's some of us that don't know anything about sex, but we know that it's a big deal. We know that if we don't go to that party, if we don't watch that video, if we don't date that person, if we don't sleep with that person, then we will be left out. Here's my point. Sex was never designed to be the cure for our desire for control. It's never designed to take away loneliness. It's never designed to be a cure for connection or belonging or intimacy or true love. And if we want to feel a sense of control of, over those desires in our life, then friends, we need Jesus' help. I mean, that's what Jesus meant when, when he said this. If you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. 
And so friends, when we unbox the Bible to see what it has to say to us about sex, what we find it telling us is that sex is not everything. It shows us that sex should never be the reason that we compromise who we are or our faith or our values. And let me just tell you something on the side. You don't owe anybody sex, ever, no matter what they say to you. It's not a part of the equation. That's not what it's designed for. The Bible shows us that if our desire for sex comes first in our life, then it will end up controlling us, and we will have to do what it tells us even when we don't want to. Even when we want to move in a different direction, it will trap us. And it And the Bible shows us that our deepest desires for connection, belonging, intimacy, real kind of love was never meant to be met by sex. But that our deepest desires are met by trusting and knowing God. So friend, here's my challenge for all of us tonight across all of our campuses. Stop trying to satisfy all your desires by using sex. It, it won't work. It doesn't work. Do not look to sex to make you happy or to give you a sense of control because you will end up losing control in the process. But instead, let go of that control and begin to trust Jesus to reorder your desires and give you focus. Focus. And then give you the kind of control that overcomes those desires and pushes you in the right direction in your life. And honestly, my my, my prayer tonight, the thing that I most hope is that all of you would find your deepest sense of direction and hope and, and peace for your desires in your relationship with God. Because when we put our desires in him, when we, when we put our hope in him, it multiplies. It, it doesn't trap us. It sets us free. It doesn't bind us or blind us. It gives us sight. It never takes away who we are. It shows us who we can be. And so, friends, if, if you're ready to not be controlled by your desires, then, man, Give control of your life over to Jesus and allow him to reorder those desires for your future and for his glory. Let's pray together at all of our campuses. Jesus, uh, this can be an awkward, weird topic to talk about. But God, I, I pray that right now, students all across the Twin Cities would begin to realize that that maybe the life that they're living is because of a desire that's leading them in the wrong direction. Or God, I pray that you would help visualize desires being in front of us instead of behind us. God, you would show us areas in our life that, we, that we've gone off track, that, that we've overemphasized. And God, I pray that, I pray God that we would have the courage to put our trust in you and that you would be our greatest desire. And that, God, you would multiply that and extend it. Thank you, God, for, for get, being a source of true love for us, true connection. Lord, we trust you and we love you. In Christ's holy name, amen. Thanks, Rev. See you next week.